Hello everyone and hello from Malaysia. Welcome to the sixth program of the Biosafety and Biosecurity Month October 2020. A month to raise biosafety and biosecurity awareness. And thank you very much for your participation today. You have joined our webinar on Fundamentals of Biological Agent and Risk Group. What laboratorians and stakeholders should know. And we'll begin our program shortly. I'd like to kick off today's program by reminding you some of the housekeeping items as seen on the screen. First of all, please turn off your microphone during the section and only unmute when, I, when you are required to speak. Please turn on your camera so that we can see each other. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to message us on the chat box. We will try our best to address your concerns. The chat box is also there for you all to introduce yourself. Please give us your name and your organization. Last but not least, no phone call or disruption during the section. Not that this section will be recorded and live on YouTube. The recording will be saved on our YouTube channel right after the sections. An evaluation survey will appear at the end of our section. Please spend some of the time to provide your feedback, as it will be really meaningful for us to improve our next sections. Thank you very much for your attention, and once again, Welcome all to the sixth webinar organized by EMS Institutional Biosafety Committee as a part of October 2020 Biosafety and Biosecurity Month at EMS University. My name is Corinne Singh. I'm proud to tell you that I am a BSc Biotechnology degree student at EMS University. It is a great honor for me to serve as the MC for this Biosafety and Biosecurity webinar series. If anyone has any issue with audio or video, Please use the chat box and we will do our best to help you. To start the section, I invite IBC Chairman, Senior Associate Professor Dr. Subash to say a few words and introduce the moderator and speaker of today's webinar. Dr. Subash, first is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Insing. Uh, very good morning to all the participants, those are in this virtual room. We have participants from different time zones. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. First, I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank all the participants for taking the time to join this uh, webinar, which is a part of our Bicepity and Bicycurity webinar series. As you know, Globally, we are going through a difficult time. And uh, because of all this uh, ongoing uh, pandemic, uh, as of today, globally, we have lost 1,128,896 lives. It's very painful. And it's happening because of this pandemic. So that's why the biosafety and biosecurity is important. So uh, I hope uh, your family, family members, friends, and loved ones are safe and in good health. Ames University is uh, observing October 2020 uh, as a Bicepty and Bicurity Month. The main aim of this Bicepty and Bicurity Month is to uh, raise the Bicepty and Bicurity awareness among our students, staff, 
all the stakeholders and associates of the Ames University. However, because now you are working, we are working in new normal. So all these webinars are open to the public. Anybody can join. So uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, that's why everybody is invited. So to promote the biosafety and biosecurity, we have organized 11 webinars. Today's webinar is webinar number six. And I firmly believe that all these webinars which we have organized, as well as other activities, uh, uh, including poster presentation competition, will definitely help all the participants to raise their awareness about the biosafety and biosecurity. It will help them to uh, understand different elements of biosafety and biosecurity. So today's webinar on uh, fundamentals of biological agents and uh, uh, risk groups, what laboratorians should know and uh, what laboratorians and stakeholders should know, it's an important topic. And uh, uh, this webinar uh, is number six, as I mentioned. Uh, so uh, uh, later on, I will tell you uh, one good news. So uh, for this uh, webinar series, so far we have participants from 12 countries. I'm very happy because of uh, this uh, new normal, uh, other people from other countries are participating and uh, th there is a more participation because last year we have organized by safety and by security month, but that one was just within the campus of Ames University. So this year, because of this new normal, we are going uh, virtually and open. So uh, Participants from 12 countries are participating and becoming part of our Biosafety and Biosecurity Month. So we have participants from India, uh, Japan, uh, Indonesia, Algeria, Nigeria, Vietnam, uh, Australia, Libya, Nepal, Philippines, uh, United States of America, as well as uh, uh, majority are from Malaysia. So I want to take uh, this uh, opportunity to thank uh, senior management of Ames University because uh, they are giving a full support to uh, implement the Biosafety and Biosecurity Month at Ames University. And I'm very grateful to them for giving me freedom to implement this Biosafety and Biosecurity Month. I also want to thank all the members of Bi uh, uh, Institutional Biosafety Committee of Ames University uh, for their uh, support in implementing these activities and uh, our webinar series. Uh, today's speaker, we have wonderful speaker, Dr. Kenneth. Uh, he has wonderful experience and definitely all the participants will benefit from his uh, uh, talk. So uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kenneth for uh, in, uh, accepting our invitation to become a part of uh, our Biosafety and Biosecurity Month. Also, I want to thank uh, especially uh, Dr. Susan Kelly, who is going to moderate today's session. Uh, she's very kind enough because it's a late evening in the United States of America, but uh, she uh, agreed to uh, moderate the session. So a little bit about uh, Dr. Kelly. I just want to, uh, her, her experience is very wide and uh, her CV is very long, but I just want to highlight uh, six, seven points. Uh, Dr. Susan Kelly, uh, carries a bachelor's degree in uh, organizational uh, psychology from Purdue University. Her PhD doc, doc, uh, degree or uh, doctorate degree is in uh, veterinary medicine. Veterinary medicine is very important. Uh, from the, I mean, uh, she completed doctorate from the University of California at Davis. And uh, she earned her postdoctoral masters in comparative pathology when she was working on vaccine research at the California National uh, Pri Primate Research Center. And uh, currently she is a principal member of the technical staff for the global uh, chemical, biological, uh, chemical and biological security group at uh, National, uh, uh, Sandia National Laboratories in United States of America which is a very, very popular, not only in uh, US, but globally because they are doing a wonderful job. Her life's work experience on uh, uh, focuses on a whole of government approaches to chemical, biological, as well as radiological safety and security. And uh, she's currently, uh, sorry, she, 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 she's a, uh, chosen a number of times by the federal government of United uh, States of America 
to work as a consultant on uh, various uh, projects uh, and uh, uh, to make sure that projects will be successful. See how extensive experience in clinical practice, diagnostic laboratories, uh, research laboratories, as well as response. She is a member of the Phi Beta Kappa uh, National and uh, Golden Key International Honors uh, Societies. So thank you very much, Dr. Kelly, uh, for accepting our invitation and becoming part of Biosafety and Biosecurity Month. Uh, last but certainly not least, I want to thank uh, uh, biotechnology students uh, of Ames University. Those are, those are volunteering uh, their precious time to uh, help Institutional Biosafety Committee to implement the uh, webinar series as well as other activities at Ames University. And uh, I just want to share with all the audience, we have organized 11 webinars, but on coming Monday, there will be a special webinar uh, dialogue session. Uh, we will have the coordinator of the Malaysian One Health University Network, Professor Latipa will be talking on that day. And uh, we have also invited the coordinator of Vietnam One Health University Network. She is also going to share with us uh, his experience and what they are doing uh, from One Health perspective. So uh, all uh, webinars are equally important, but Monday we have a special webinar. So don't forget to join us on uh, Monday. So I'm just alerting you so you can mark the calendar. So once again, uh, thank you uh, all of you. And uh, without further ado, uh, uh, please uh, Insing lead the way. Thank you, Dr. Subhash. Now I request the moderator of the webinar, Dr. Susan Kelly, to introduce the speaker and start the section. Dr. Susan, please. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Subhash, for the kind introduction. I'm very excited to be with you all again today. And I will be joining you for that wonderful session we have planned for Monday as well. You know, while we're still here celebrating the Biosafety and Biosecurity Month for Ames University, it's important for us to remember that biosafety and biosecurity are the two pillars that make up biorisk management. And you all know by now that the first step in biorisk management is to take a look at the risk assessment to do a complete and very well educated risk assessment based on the procedures that you're about to undertake with a pathogen and the characteristics of that pathogen itself. Because after all, how can you come up with good mitigation measures for those risks if you don't know what you're mitigating against? And so today is a very important topic because we're going to talk about characteristics of pathogens that define the risk group they're included in. This is the type of information that you need to insert into that risk assessment to be able to choose the proper mitigations so you're not only safe, but you're doing something cost effective and more likely to work, <laughs> which is always important. You don't wanna waste your time and have to rebuild your mitigation program. Whenever you work with a new pathogen, like severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, the illness, there are some new factors that you have to take into account. It may be difficult in the beginning to assign a risk group to a new pathogen. Sometimes that risk group changes with new information about the pathogen. But it's important to know what risk group that pathogen is before you work with it in a laboratory to help you decide things like what biosafety level should I be at before I handle that? What mitigation measures should I have in place already? If you want someone to help you understand risk groups and particularly to explain them to you, you can't do better than finding a professor who knows everything about them. It's also especially helpful if you're thinking of working with SARS-CoV-2 that you find an associate professor like the one we have today that has worked with COVID-19 
And that's why I'm very, very honored to be able to present to you the Associate Professor Kenneth Rodriguez. He's a molecular biologist and researcher at the Biotechnology Research Institute, University of Malaysia, Sabah. He's also a certified trainer, very good skill set to have if you're going to be helping other people. So we know we can ask him our questions in the area of biological risk management. And he's a full-fledged member of the Malaysian Biosafety and Biosecurity Association. Keep in mind, during his career, he has conducted training for all sorts of levels of individuals, everything from employees of national agencies involved in public health, as well as university lecturers and students. He's also a member of the Institutional Biosafety Committee, which administers the implementation of biosafety policy at the university. So he's a subject matter expert in that field. In addition, he's also been the member, a member of the team involved in the diagnosis and detection of COVID-19 in Sabah, Malaysia. So now is the time to prepare all of your questions with regard to bio-risk management, risk groups, even specific questions about COVID-19 for our lecturer today, Dr. Kenneth Rodriguez, who will talk about the fundamentals of biological agents and risk groups. Please feel free to type your questions as you think of them into the chat box. We'll be sharing those questions with our speaker once he's done with his lecture portion. Uh, and without further ado, please turn your attention to Dr. Rodriguez. You Can you hear? Yeah. Is it okay? Copy? Yeah. Can you copy? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly, for your introduction. And very good morning. Salamat pagi to everyone in Malaysia. And good afternoon to our listeners in Africa and Europe. And I think it's good evening or good night to uh, Dr. Kelly in the USA. So firstly, I would like to acknowledge Sandia National Laboratories. In fact, the team at Sandia National Laboratories were our first trainers in 2013. And they have instructed us in the models, AMP models. And of course, that has been very effective in combating the uh, pandemic at this stage. Because when uh, Sandia National Laboratories trained us in risk assessment and risk mitigation, we could actually approach the problem head on when we uh, had encountered it in Sabah. And we were able to set up the laboratory and uh, get it operational within about four weeks. So thank you very much to SNL for the training. Okay, I'm obliged. Okay, so we now move on to my lecture. So my lecture will basically, I will share my screen, but before that we test whether the screen is being shared. Okay. Can you view the screen, Dr. Subhash, before I present? Yes, yes, we can see. Yeah, okay, okay. I proceed to the first slide. So as, okay, okay I move on to the presentation. Slide show, okay. Okay, I give it some time to come up on the screen. Is it visible now? Yes, yes. It's okay, visible. thank you. Is it according to the uh, the aspect ratio of your screen? I think Is it full uh, screen. Uh, maybe you have to add this. It's not full screen. Some uh, okay. license I can see um, on other side. Okay, okay. So this is basically the projection of the. Okay. Okay. So one second. Yeah. So okay. now presentation mode, uh, you can, uh, I mean, click at the bottom, presentation yeah. mode. So it will become full screen. Okay. So can you do that? Uh, I just, from beginning, right? So I present it. For some reason, I'm, uh, can I, uh, Dr. Subhash, I will just adjust my screen, okay? So the... At, at the bottom, there is a, I mean, full screen mode, that icon. You just click that one uh, just before the volume bar. So it will become full screen. Okay. I can't find it now because I have multiple screens. Okay. I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah, and that one. Perfect. Is it okay now? Uh, I think it's uh, getting ready. Okay. Maybe you click one more time. I think it... Yeah, I share my screen again. I just shut down. Sorry about that because of the, okay. Oh, perfect. Great, great. Go ahead. Okay, okay. 
So thank you very much and sorry for the uh, little bit of confusion. So we proceed directly into the lecture and for your information, the objective or the gist of today's presentation is awareness. So I'm going to keep it with that theme on awareness. So we generate awareness. So although I'm going to delve into different concepts and uh, basically practices, I would like to emphasize awareness. And please keep your questions posted in the uh, chat box and I will take them at the end of the session. So whenever, if you, whenever you feel the need to ask a question, please proceed and ask the question. Okay, so we now move on to the actual lecture. So this topic which has been assigned to me is fundamentals of biological agents and risk groups, what laboratorians and stakeholders should know. Now, these are two entirely different topics which I have tried to synthesize. So the first one is biological agents. The second one is risk groups. Okay. So all my lecture content is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution license. You are free to reuse it, download and remix. I will share all the content with you. Okay. So what do we cover in today's lecture? So I will be covering the first thing, which is terminology. Now, when you are a bio-risk manager, you should be aware of specific terminologies. And these terminologies have been defined in different biosafety manuals. So in today's uh, lecture, we will focus on the two terminologies. One is biological agents and one is biological assets. Now, when you look or consider the bio-risk management from a biosafety perspective, we use the term biological agent. However, when you consider everything from the perspective of biosecurity, you use the term biological asset. And these two terms have to be used by bio-risk managers in order to communicate the concept across to the audience as well as to your coworkers. We will then move on to what is known as the AMP model, which is uh, basically risk assessment, risk mitigation, and performance assessment. I will introduce you to some of the biological agents, risk groups, and the routes of transmission. I will also delve into some aspects of biosafety and biosecurity during the course of this particular lecture. Okay, now what is our primary area of concern in this current situation? There are two factors which you need to look at from the biorisk manager's perspective. One is the lack of oversight, which is a biosafety issue. And one is intentional release, which is a biosecurity issue. Now, when we are conducting uh, laboratory experiments, especially uh, those involving genetically modified organisms, which is a gain of function uh, experiment, we have to basically look at the containment. And if there is a lack of oversight, we basically do not pay attention to containment. And then if you have a breach of containment, you will have a problem like the one which we are encountering today. The other one is intentional release. Now, when we have a biological agent, and a biological asset, there can be some actors, either state actors or non-state actors who utilize that biological asset to create some kind of disequilibrium in society. So you can use a biological agent in order to create economic disruption. And this falls into the domain of intentional release. And this is what we will be discussing today with respect to biological agents. Okay, this is the AMP model. I'll uh, go to it very briefly because this fo forms the core of our training in bio-risk management. So we have the risk assessment, which is the first step. We have risk mitigation, and finally we have performance assessment. And this process is cyclical, and it basically involves continuous quality improvement. And the risk groups is basically what we address during the process of risk assessment. And please take note that the risk assessment is subjective. It depends on the situation, as we always use the term when we do the training, but our trainers say it depends. So it varies based on the particular circumstances of your respective region or your respective laboratory facility. Okay. Let's delve into the first section of this lecture, which will focus on the biological agents themselves. Okay, this is the definition from, of biological agents from the EU directive, so you can refer to this. So a biological agent is any microorganism, including those which may have been genetically modified, cell cultures and endoparasites, which may be able to provoke any infection, allergy or toxicity in humans, animals or plants. Now, when you look at this 
specific definition, you will note that the description also focuses on humans, animals, or plants, because the biological agents can cause an impact on human health as well as on plant and animal health. Okay, the first biological agent which we will look at is a virus itself. So the current pandemic has raised awareness about viruses. And what viruses are is basically a biochemical molecule. They are not living organisms. The virus cannot replicate outside of the host. So they have a core which is composed of nucleic acids and a protein capsid. Okay, so there, is a, there are two distinct uh, regions in terms of the structure of a virus. Now, viruses are classified using what is termed as a Baltimore classification scheme. Those of you who are from the uh, biotechnology or virology field will know about the Baltimore classification scheme. And this scheme basically classifies the virus based on their nucleic acid composition. So we have uh, single-stranded RNA viruses, double-stranded RNA viruses, and we have the DNA viruses, as well as the retrotranscribing viruses. I will not delve into the Baltimore scheme for the purpose of this lecture, but this is a basic definition. So what is of concern to us is the ability of viruses to mutate within a host. Viruses, as I have informed you earlier, cannot mutate or cannot replicate outside of the host they have the ability to mutate within the host. And this characteristic of viruses enables them to become infectious or their infectivity is enhanced. And as you may be aware now, the current virus, which is the COVID-19 is basically mutating and you have variants all across the world. And as Dr. Kelly mentioned earlier, the risk group basically will change as the mutations or more information becomes available. So this information is al also related to the immunological aspects as well as the epidemiological aspects. We also have zoonotic viruses, which are transmitted from animal to human host and vice versa. And we are basically concerned with viruses which are transmitted via multiple routes, including aerosols. Now, you, if you read or if you are keeping in touch with the current research on COVID-19, you will know that there are currently many publications coming about the ability of the virus to survive on surfaces, what are known as fomites. This is another technical term. And more and more information is coming to light as researchers progress in uh, finding out more about this virus. So this is basically uh, some information on viruses. Okay, so these are some of the viruses which are of concern. So we have the avian influenza virus, the Ebola virus, coronaviruses, and some of these viruses are region specific. They may be confined to a specific region and they can be contained within that region. However, as the current pandemic has demonstrated, certain viruses can basically breach the barriers like national barriers and basically cause infectivity on a global scale. We now move on to bacteria. So bacteria are an essential microflora in our system. We have a commensal and symbiotic bacteria which are associated with us and which are important from the perspective of the physiological functions in, our, uh, human, in the human body. So when we look at pathogenic bacteria, we basically identify pathogenic bacteria in terms of their specific genetic elements. So pathogenic bacteria contain what are known as pathogenicity islands. These are regions of the genome which encode specific genes such as endotoxins, and these can be harmful to humans. And what is of concern to us from the biosecurity and biosafety perspective is the multi-drug resistant bacteria, which have emerged in response to antibiotic and other antimicrobial drugs. Now, the uh, emergence of multidrug resistant bacteria is linked to the ability to transfer genes horizontally. So for instance, if you have an E. coli, which is harboring a plasmid or a DNA element, which is conferring it with antibiotic resistance, this bacterium has the ability to transfer it to other species. And this is a cause of concern in terms of the antibiotic resistance. We also have what are known as nosocomial infection hospital acquired infections. And in the current situation with COVID-19 and laboratory analysis, we should also be aware of what are known as the LAIs or the laboratory acquired infections. 
And another region or another area of concern to us is the spore forming bacteria. These are bacteria which have the ability to form spores or sporulate. And these spores can be utilized as a potential bioweapon. Okay, some of the bacterial pathogens of concern are mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is actually a photograph of a, a bacillus which has been isolated from soil and we actually identified it as bacillus anthracis even though it was isolated from a local soil sample. So these bacteria are potentially present in the soil. We also have Escherichia coli which uh, the pathogenic version, Vibrio cholerae, Helicobacter, Pseudomonas and Salmonella. Now, fungi are less likely to be biological agents. However, we have certain fungi which may infect immunocompromised patients. So we have aspergillus, which is linked to the causative agent of aspergillosis, histoplasma, and cryptococcus neoformans. So these are basically fungi which uh, infect immunocompromised patients. So. One of the uh, pathogens of concern is Candida auris. Basically, uh, a pathogen becomes a cause of concern or uh, issue when we cannot detect it easily or when the detection methods are too, how do you say, it is, it, it's not robust enough. So Candida auris is one of the pathogens which is multi-drug resistant and it is difficult to identify using standard microbiological assays. And this causes outbreaks in healthcare settings. In addition to these biological agents, we also have parasites, which are of concern in biosafety facilities, especially if you're conducting experiments involving animal models. We also have biotoxins. There are two types of biotoxins. We have the naturally occurring biotoxins, such as saxitoxin, and we have the synthetic toxins. And finally, we have prion diseases. These prion or prion diseases are rare, and they are basically uh, linked to misfolded proteins. Now, a prion disease is very unique in the sense that a protein which is benign, when it is misfolded, it can actually become pathogenic or toxic. And this pathogen uh, is termed as a prion. It's a non-living organism. However, a prion, a, a protein which is a prion, has the ability to basically transfer its uh, uh, configuration to other proteins. And this raises uh, concerns to combating prion diseases. So if you are aware of what was termed as the, the mad cow disease, which was transmitted by a cattle, by a bovids, this is an example of the prion disease. Okay, now what is of concern to us is the toxins. And as you may be aware, and as you may have read in the news, there were certain cases of poisoning in the UK uh, which is linked to certain toxins, and these are the nerve agents. And toxins are basically very, uh, how do you say, very, inf uh, very infectious at a very low stage. We cannot call them infectious, but basically a toxin can be delivered via aerosol. It can be even delivered on a surface. And as you, can, as you may have read in the case with UK, it's not only the intended targets which were basically rendered, uh, they, you had a morbidity. However, you also had the, the police officers who were handling that case, who were exposed to this particular toxins. And the term which was used in the uh, news is basically Novichok, which is the new, the new toxins. And this is a new class of toxins. They are basically nerve agents, which are used in biological warfare. However, we also have naturally occurring toxins, uh, such as the sexy toxins, which you can isolate from shellfish. And this causes the paralytic selfish poisoning. Many people in Malaysia and the Southeast Asian countries are basically exposed to sexy toxins when they consume uh, mussels or the bivalves. Now, I move on to what, what I wanted to introduce you in terms of risk group, and this is genetically modified organisms. And I'm going to lay special emphasis on what is known as GOF, gain of function experiments and DURC or dual use research of concern. These are two areas which I want to highlight at this stage because of the developments in genetic engineering. Now, all genetic engineer, uh, genetically modified organisms which are benign can be infectious at certain stages. I'll explain this very briefly to you. 
most countries have uh, laws which concern genetic modification. For example, in Malaysia, we have the Biosafety Act. So we are restricted from modifying organisms and we need to obtain special permission in order to modify the organism and we need to undergo a thorough process of risk assessment. However, the emergence of what is known as the DIY or do-it-yourself biotech people who do biotech experiments in their garage or in their basement at home raises the specter of a very big threat of genetically modified organisms. In today's uh, system, you can basically order a synthetic gene on Amazon or eBay. You can order it online or you can order it, make a purchase online and you can construct a virus. I'm not telling you to construct a virus, but I'm telling you there is a possibility. You can construct a virus in your laboratory. For instance, if I, we are currently working on the uh, antigen with COVID-19, we synthesize the toxin, uh, the, the gene encoding the antigen, and we basically clone it in E. coli to be used as an antigen. However, if we are a non-state actor, what is known as the a bioterrorist, you can actually synthesize genes, uh, join them together, and basically develop a new virus. So this is one of the... Um, dangers which we are currently facing. So this is basically a gain of function experiment. Let me explain to you very briefly. So for instance, you have the uh, coronavirus genome. We take out the SARS-CoV genome and we have a certain uh, region which is linked to a receptor, which makes this virus, a human being susceptible to this virus. If I modify that receptor only slightly, just change a few amino acid, the virus can infect another host. It may infect, for instance, a fish or maybe a, a deer or any other host. So by modifying a certain section of the viral genome, you can make it more infectious. And this is basically a gain of function experiment. This is an example of a gain of function experiment. And we also have what is known as dual use research of concern. Now, this is basically one area, for instance, if I'm a state actor, a state government, and I'm having a certain uh, organism in my laboratory, and it's basically a safe organism, what is known as a GRAS, or generally regarded as safe organism. And for instance, I have some kind of surreptitious experiment. I decide to do something which is uh, surreptitious. I want to carry out a modification. I can use that same organism, which is benign, for uh, use which is non-benign. And this is what is known as the DURC or dual reuse research of concern. Today, you can visit a parts registry. Basically, there is a synthetic biology working group online and they have a website known as parts registry. And they basically have all the parts. Parts refer to genetic elements which you can buy from them or you can become a member and you get those parts and you can assemble different organisms using those parts. So this is where DURC and GOF basically are of concern or of importance to biosafety officers and biorisk managers. Okay, now this is an amazing discovery. These two remarkable women in science, they have been awarded the chemistry Nobel. And as you know, we are dealing with a biological agent, but they have a Nobel Prize for chemistry because from the perspective of the biotechnology, a modification in the DNA or a modification in the protein actually is a biochemical modification. So you have a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Now, what these two amazing researchers have done is that they have developed genetic scissors, which are based on a specific enzyme which, with which you can uh, basically delete genes from the genome or add new genes into the genome. And this procedure can be carried out with high precision those of you who are from the biotechnology and molecular biology fields may be aware of this. And this particular revolutionary technology will enable us to control the genome. And as the research progresses, it will become more and more difficult to control these kind of experiments because they can be carried out anywhere without informing anybody. And this is a cause of concern to us. So you can read more about CRISPR. I have shared the links with you. We now move on to the second component of this particular presentation, which is risk groups. And the risk groups are basically based on the World Health Organization classification. I have prepared a graphic for you, so you, uh, which basically summarizes the risk groups and we'll go through it one by one. So risk group one is basically, I have put up colors here, green and green. So the green is individual, and this is community, where you have the three uh, icons. 
So risk group one poses a low individual risk, a low community risk, and a microorganism that is unlikely to cause human or animal disease. Okay, a simple example may be uh, uh, you get diarrhea because you had food poisoning and you don't really get sick. There is no morbidity and there's no mortality. You just have a mild stomachache and diarrhea, and this will be risk group one. However, this should be taken with a caveat. So you should be aware that certain people who are immunocompromised, for them risk group one may be actually equivalent to risk group four. So be aware of these factors when you are doing a risk assessment. It's not generic, it's very, very specific. Okay, we move on to risk group two. Now the individual has basically become yellow. So that's a moderate individual risk and a low community risk. Now this is basically a pathogen which can be contained and which is not transmitted via normal routes such as aerosols or via the fecal oral route. Okay, so the pathogen can cause human or animal disease but is unlikely to be a serious hazard to laboratory workers, the community, livestock or the environment. And the laboratory exposure may cause a severe infection. However, effective treatment in the form of therapeutic or vaccines is available and the risk of infection is limited. So this is risk group two. So if you have a breach of containment with respect to risk group two, you can identify the individuals and contain those individuals or basically quarantine them. Okay, risk group three is basically high individual risk and a low community risk. Now, this basically relates to biological agents which cannot be readily transmitted from the individual to the community unless there is a percutaneous, uh, basically, infection or where there is an intentional release. So, uh, risk group 3 is a pathogen that causes serious human or animal disease, but not is not ordinarily spread from one infected individual to another, and effective treatment and preventive measures are available. And at the end of our countdown is risk group four. And this is a cause of concern to all of us now. So we have an, a biological agent which has a high individual risk. It poses a high risk to the community and it causes serious human or animal disease that is readily transmitted and effective treatment is not available. So if you don't have a vaccine, this is basically risk group four. So you have no vaccine, you have a high individual risk, you have a risk of aerosol transmission, and this is risk group four for you. Now, as we look at risk group, we should look at the WHO, the World Health Organization recommendation. So please refer to the references at the end of this lecture. I've given you links. So you basically have to look at regional factors. So the pathogenicity of an organism is defined by its genetic material. However, we have to look into account, uh, take into account the localized factors. For instance, a pathogen which is endemic in uh, Southeast Asia may be exotic in uh, America or a temperate or a polar region. Okay, so that is linked to the regional factors. So. We also have to look at what are known as variants. So pathogens have variants. Uh, so vari a variation refers to a modification of the genome, uh, which can be either via genetic engineering or via the process of natural mutation and evolution. So the pathogenicity is defined by the environment as well as by the genome. We also have to look at the mode of transmission. For instance, if you, if you do not have the vector to transmit your particular biological agent, for instance, you have, do not have mosquitoes, you cannot transmit the, uh, vec uh, the pathogens which are transmitted via the vectors. We also have to look at environmental factors. For instance, there, have, there has been a lot of linkage with, uh, with the global warming and the uh, development or the evolution of new parasites. And there, we have to look at the local availability of effective preventive measures. For instance, economically backward countries or developing countries may not have the requisite preventive measures and the treatment as well as the expertise to combat uh, this, this uh, biological agent. So what I want to emphasize is that this particular aspect of biorisk management must be looked at from a global perspective. It is no longer one country working by itself. It's basically a global, globalized effort to combat uh, these biological agents or these threats from biological agents. Okay, now 
those of you who are uh, from the field of biosafety will be aware of the PSDS, just as you are from the chemical field, you have the, uh, the material safety data sheet for your, for your uh, basically your chemicals in the lab. We have our PSDS, so this forms our uh, manual. So this is from the Government of Canada and a uh, big thank you to the Government of Canada for preparing this excellent resource material. You can basically find it online. You can click on the link. I will share the link with you. And you can basically develop PSDS for your own laboratory based on your localized uh, available pathogen. They have a template. So basically you can complete the PSDS and the PSDS provides you with information related to that biological agent. But again, I would like to emphasize as Dr. Kelly has mentioned, the PSDS should always be considered along with the new and emerging information. So if there's a variant in the particular biological agent, you will have to take that into account during your process of risk assessment. We now move on to the routes of transmission or should I route or route of transmission as it's pronounced in the US or in Asia? Okay, so there are different routes of transmission. So we have the first route, which is direct contact, which is uh, the tissues or fluids from infected individual. We have what are known as formites. Please be aware of this term in biosafety management. Formite is basically an inanimate object contaminated by an infected individual. It can be in the form of a door knob, a glass door, a toilet seat, a car seat. It can be anything so, which can uh, basically serve as a surface to uh, carry that organism across. We have aerosols. Uh, the oral route. So this is generally used uh, in terms of the uh, pathogens which cause food poisoning. We have what is known as an infectious dose or the number of uh, basically the number of colony forming units which can lead to infection in a healthy human adult. And we have uh, vector borne pathogens which are transmitted via, for instance, flies, ticks, as well as mosquitoes. And we have zoonotic pathogens, which are transmitted from animals to human hosts and vice versa. So in the case of uh, zoonotic pathogens, modern genetic engineering and uh, genome sequencing has made it possible for us to predict whether a biological agent, which is a virus or a bacterium, can be transmitted from one uh, a human host to an animal host because of the receptors. Viruses have receptors encoded in their genome. These receptors are basically uh, proteins in their, uh, which enable them to fit into receptor. So I don't have a whiteboard with me right now, but I would like to tell you, uh, give you an analogy to this. So you can take a receptor, for example, a receptor on, your, on a cell will be like a lock. Okay, it's a lock and the virus has that key. Okay, so imagine a lock and the key. You can only have one key and you can only have one lock, it's unique. So certain viruses have specific receptors or specific keys to enter into cells. And this is what makes them very infectious or highly infectious to specific hosts. And if you have a lock in two hosts, for example, you have a, the same lock in the animal host and the same lock in the human host and the same key, that's what makes it transmissible. Now, uh, molecular biologists look at the receptors in a viral genome and they can identify, for ex example, if you have a, a receptor which is homologous to bats and it's homologous to humans, you have a likelihood of transmission. So this actually enables us to do surveillance on viruses by purely sequencing and viewing their genomes. The next aspect which we look at is the portal of entry. So the portal of entry is basically the manner by which a pathogen enters a susceptible host. So we have the respiratory route, which is uh, the influenza virus and the coronaviruses or the SARS viruses. We have the fecal oral route, which is Escherichia coli. We have the ocular conjunctival route, which is SARS. However, in the current context, in the current pandemic, we have to take the we have to assume the highest risk because we do not know there are many many elements or many factors which we are not aware of so we have to take the precaution in terms of all the routes of infection and uh, although uh, the virus some uh, the current virus is spread via a respiratory route viruses are also shared in the fecal matter Okay, there, are, there are cases whereby when we had, a, for instance, you have an apartment block and you have a leaky, leaky sewerage system, as in the case in Hong Kong, the, the, uh, the, basically the inhabitants or the tenants from below in, who are in link to that sewage line also had infections. So you have to look at viruses in terms of how they are shed. It's not only through the, basically the respiratory route, it's also the, uh, the fecal route. 
We also have the cutaneous root. Basically, it's via the skin. And thankfully, we do not have viruses which <laughs> enter through the skin. So uh, there is a process known as endocytosis in the case of viruses. So basically, viruses, in addition to entering your cell via receptors, uh, they can also enter into cells via a process known as endocytosis or take through the plasma membrane. And if we have these kind of viruses or if someone engineers these viruses, this will be a really big challenge because viruses which are transmitted cutaneously is, it, it will be lethal. So in terms of the biosecurity planning, we have to plan for possible mutations which will be via the cutaneous route. Uh, the percutaneous route is less likely. This is what we encounter in the laboratory. If you have, a, for instance, we have a needle stick injury, you accidentally puncture your skin with a needle, you have a percutaneous uh, portal of entry. And finally, we have our mucous membranes, which uh, basically can serve as the uh, focal point or the launching point for viruses. So basically, the virus enters your mucous membrane, and then you will have its entry via receptors or via endocytosis or exocytosis, as the case may be. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's lecture. I have taken about how much of your time? Around an hour of your time. And basically, I will look forward to questions. So I'll basically summarize what I have introduced to you during the course of this uh, presentation. So in this presentation, we have basically looked at concepts and terminology. It is not possible for me to introduce you to all the terminology within the scope of one hour. Generally, we reiterate that over a period of maybe two or three weeks during training, we'll keep on saying biosafety, biological asset, and we keep on saying biological, uh, all these terms are used uh, during the course of training. So we reiterate. And uh, if you are aware, uh, Madam Luann Burnett, she is uh, one who trained us as well. And she really emphasizes all these teachings, uh, styles in terms of training. But I will summarize briefly. So we have looked at biological agents. We have looked at the risk groups, the four risk groups. We have looked at the route of transmission, the route of transmission, and we have looked at the portal of entry. So this is basically a summary of uh, this module. So we go back to the AMP. So when we uh, look, I will reiterate this, and I reiterate it all the time because I want it to sink in. We have the risk assessment, risk mitigation, and performance assessment. So risk assessment is the first step. So this is where you look at the risk groups and the other factors involved in assessing the risk. So risk is basically a function of likelihood and consequence. So basically look at the likelihood and consequence. And then we move on to the risk mitigation. So risk mitigation basically focuses on the five controls, elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. So there we have a hierarchy. And finally, as a biosafety officer, you need to look at performance assessment. Performance assessment is basically an audit of your entire system. So you do a bench audit, you do an accident and uh, an incident analysis, and then you basically improve the system. So that's the gist or the philosophy is to continuously improve your bio-risk management system at your laboratory. Okay, I would like to acknowledge the Malaysian Biosafety and Biosecurity Association, which has been instrumental in training a large number of Malaysians in terms of the biosafety and biosecurity aspect. Their training is really good. If they do conduct a training, please do attend it. I would like to thank Sandia National Laboratories, and they have been uh, basically my foundation, especially with respect to the AMP model. And their training has been excellent. I had attended their training over a period of around eight weeks, which was conducted in Kuala Lumpur. I would also like to acknowledge Robert Heckert Consulting. He is also one of our trainers. And I have inserted a link to what is known as the GB, uh, uh, the Global Bio-Risk Management Curriculum. You can uh, click on this link, and you may have to obtain permission from Sandia National Laboratories to access this content. But this, this content is a wealth of information. You can adopt it to your particular situation. And basically, it covers everything in terms of the bio-risk management. OK, these are some of the references. The links are all active. I will share this uh, PDF with you. And you can click on the links, and you can access this. So we have the WHO Laboratory Biosafety Manual. And you should be looking at this. I cannot share this with you because it's a copyrighted material. Please look at ISO 35001-2019. So this is bio-risk management for laboratories and other related organ uh, organizations. This not only covers your laboratory aspects, it also covers waste management. And it's a very comprehensive uh, 
system which you can adopt at your respective laboratories. We have the CWA 157, uh, 15793 and the CWA 16393 2012. So these are some of the references which we constantly refer to during our, the course of our career as a bio-risk manager. Okay, with that, I would like to thank everyone and we move on to the question answer session. I've spoken for too long, I guess. Dr. Subhash, am I okay for time? Yeah, you are within time, perfectly fine. Yeah, please, we move on to the question and answer session and thank you very much. So I'll take questions. You can either use the speaker or look at the chat window. Yes, Dr. Rodriguez, I'm monitoring the chat window for you, uh, waiting yes. for some folks to type in their questions. I, I have something uh, to ask you though, really quickly. So uh, I was developing vaccines, you probably heard that. Yeah. Uh, at one point in my past, uh, yeah. and we were testing those directly in primates. Yeah. So we were doing a little bit of genetic engineering. Now, this was years ago. This was before CRISPR. So everything took a little bit longer and maybe wasn't quite as accurate. But one yeah. thing that I learned and, and was reinforced for me this year because of COVID-19 is that we have a lot of information on what to expect when we genetically engineer a pathogen. We know what certain genes do. We have an expectation if we insert a gene into a pathogen, we might give it this particular characteristic that we want yeah. to. Yeah. And yet at the same time, there's all these things that we don't know that might happen. So if you were just to look at uh, the virus that causes COVID-19 and you used mm -hmm. a computer program to look at the way that it, it attaches to a human cell the computer program would tell you that that virus doesn't attach very well to human cells. However, the world tells us that it actually does. It was something that the computer program that was being used at the time didn't predict terribly well. And so because of things like that, there are special restrictions in place for university laboratories and other research institutions that are creating basically new organisms through genetic engineering to make sure that those organisms never leave the laboratory and make that into the public space. Because once it gets out, we may never get it back. It will become potentially a permanent part of our planet and may have unintended consequences. How do you decide what risk group a new pathogen should be in uh, when you're creating it? Okay, that, that's a very interesting question because it raises the specter of what we call the iceberg, uh, you know, the iceberg model. So what we see is above the surface and what we don't see is below the surface. Now, regarding the prediction of the model, so we use a uh, predictive modeling as uh, Dr. Kelly mentioned, uh, the pr predictive model is based on known information. For instance, if we identify a certain receptor in the genome of a virus and then we map it to a uh, computer database, it'll look at the protein configuration or the conformation of the protein. And this will map to known, uh, known databases. And this may be one of the reasons why it's very difficult to predict the manner in which uh, a receptor will bind to a specific target. So that raises the information, uh, the question about uh, what is unknown. And basically because our immune system is so complex it's basically an unknown. You may have uh, patients who are immunocompromised. For instance, the data coming out is showing different variants. You have very elderly patients who are, who are basically uh, not uh, experiencing any symptoms. And then you have younger patients and you have mortality. So it's basically uh, new information coming in. And these kind of things, as uh, Dr. Kelly mentioned, are very hard to predict based on existing models. Thank you. Thank you. No problem, thank you. Uh, and, and I want to invite for those of you who are not uh, comfortable typing your question into the chat box or prefer to speak your question, we're going to have a moment of silence here just to leave the microphone space open for you to unmute your own microphone and ask Dr. Rodriguez your question uh, verbally. So please go ahead and speak up if you have a question for him.
it must be ah, very early there. And we do have something in the chat box that has come up. So the question is, Dr. Rodriguez, what are the roles and responsibilities for a biosecurity officer when dealing with the lab, particularly focusing on pathogens? Okay, thank you very much for your question. From whom is the question, please? From, from whom is the question? I'm trying to address the Dr. question. Dr. Subash, can you, you recognize the name? Yeah, just hold on. I think it's our student, uh, okay. possibly, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, student, our biotechnology student. I, I, I will address that question directly. So uh, in terms of the, uh, okay, let's look at it from the perspective of civilians. We are in the civilian, phase. We, I mean, we are working in civilian laboratories. So we are more concerned with the biosafety aspect. The biosecurity aspect is more of concern to military and other organizations. But having said that, you have to be careful with regard to the information security. I have another lecture basically focusing on the biosecurity aspects of management. So when you have, when you look at risk mitigation from the biosecurity perspective, you have to basically look at your inventories. You have to look at your security systems and you have to look at your information security. So you may have physical security at your laboratory in the form of the uh, specialized passcodes to enter our laboratories. For instance, at our containment facility, we have a pass, uh, uh, pass key system. We, it's what you know and your card itself. So you need to key in a code to enter in. So that's basically physical security. You will also have to maintain what is known as information security, which means uh, may, not, may involve non-publishing your work. So many of the researchers who are working with, uh, for instance, biological agents, which can be mutated, do not publish their work publicly. So they have information security as well as security on their uh, computers and other IT content. So you cannot maintain this stuff on a cloud server, which can be hacked easily. Okay, And then you have to also look at personal security as, as well. So uh, in many countries, if you're working in a uh, biosafety or biosecurity laboratory, which is uh, having, for instance, uh, biological agents, you can actually ask the police or the agencies in your respective country to screen that particular individual. For instance, if they have debts, uh, that's one of the uh, red flags. So if you have a, 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 a technician working in your lab, for instance, who has a bankruptcy or debt, that's a red flag. So it indicates that he or she may compromise your laboratory. So these are aspects which you must look at in terms of the biosecurity uh, management of your laboratory. So this is an enti entirely, so biosafety assessment, risk assessment and biosecurity risk assessment is an entirely different, uh, I mean, it's an entirely different way of doing things. Okay, thank you. I hope it answers your yes. question. I have been Absolutely. very long about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. A lot of things for a biosecurity officer to think about. And uh, those factors that you brought up, information security, physical security, those extend uh, beyond the laboratory space sometimes as well. So if you're involved in shipping any of these materials or receiving any of these materials from other laboratories, that time in which that material is in transport is a potential security risk. And so you have to be thinking about similar things uh, in terms of how you package um, and how you transport and ship these materials. How safe is it gonna be in between the two? How easy is it for someone to know what's inside the package uh, and, and take that package because of it? So definitely something uh, uh, to add to the list of things that a biosecurity officer is going to need to worry about, which is already a pretty long list. Thank, um, thank you. Okay, so we do have another question. Is the risk assessment, um, oh, sorry, if the risk assessment reveals that there is a risk to the safety and health of employees, mm -hmm. do all employees who work with biological agents need to get vaccinated? Now this, uh, thank you for the question. So this uh, uh, basically pertains to your risk assessment. So once you conduct your risk assessment, you, are, you have what is known as residual risk. And it, at this level or at this uh, juncture, your institutional biosafety com uh, committee and your biosafety officers have to make a decision regarding, uh, is it okay to work with this particular residual risk? And this is when you decide about vaccination. Now. We do what is known as the, uh, we do continuous monitoring of our laboratory personnel. So we have our ELISA testing. We do a, basically a serum analysis prior and post work. Usually it's done every six months. And if, you, if there is a vaccine available for that specific biological agent, 
you can uh, basically include it as part of your risk mitigation strategy. And this will constitute an administrative control. Okay, so you have to in include that in your SOP regarding vaccination and monitoring of the health of your personnel. So having said that, you should also look at the uh, level at which you're working in terms of the infectious dose and the volume. For instance, if I'm working with, uh, for instance, we are working with COVID-19 in the laboratory, we are not vaccinated. We just don the PPEs and we are basically inactivating the virus by following the protocols. So in this case, we do not require vaccination because once we receive the uh, viral sample, which in viral VTM or what is viral transport medium, we basically heat inactivate it. So we have an SOP in place to heat inactivate it so there's no need for vaccination in this case okay so that i hope that answers your question that's a fantastic answer and thank you and i know that we all hope that sometime soon there is a vaccine we can offer people who are working with uh with the virus that causes covid19 so um can't wait. Uh, we have another question. Um, and it says, hello there, may I know more about CWA 15793-2008 in short? Okay. The, the, it's very easy to remember the number. It's CWA 15793. <laughs> okay. Eric Cook showed us how to remember it because of the, uh, there's actually a mnemonic. <laughs> Okay, we won't go into that. But basically, when you look at uh, laboratory bio risk management, is this is what I like to emphasize. Okay, we don't look at the model itself, AMP. So it's risk assessment, risk mitigation, and performance assessment. We are basically trying to set up a laboratory bio risk management system. Okay, that's the system. So the CWA basically uh, and the WHO laboratory biosafety manuals basically tell you about the system. How do you set up the system? Okay, so the system basically comprises the uh, your uh, policy and the implementation of your policy. So, for instance, if you're in an existing organization, you'll have to you'll have a policy. For instance, you'll say we are committed to so and so, but you should end it with we are committed to laboratory research work in compliance with the biosafety protocols, or you, you have to phrase it that way. And this policy is translated into what are known as action plans. Now, these action plans may involve setting up your IBC, your Institutional Biosafety Committee, and assigning roles and responsibilities to the individuals. Following uh, that, you have to implement these measures and you have to audit or basically assess the performance of these measures. And this is what CWA15793 covers in all its entirety. Okay, that's basically, I, I'm, uh, Dr. Kelly wants to add anything? I've tried to summarize because it's a very big document. Right, it is. And I, and I want to say that if I remember this correctly, the International Standards Organization ISO 35001 mm -hmm. document was based upon um, 15793. They have simil similar amounts of information and types of information in them. Is, is that your understanding as well? Uh, yeah, but however, the, uh, uh, the CWA 15793 is more of descriptive, it's generic. It gives you a broader perspective and you can basically uh, implement it at your laboratory, or, uh, apply it in terms of both biosecurity and biosafety, whereas the ISO is more focused on the management of the biological organism and the waste itself which basically looks at different aspects of the management. Okay, so related, but not exactly the same. Not exactly uh, so the same. If, if, you're, if you're able to acquire a copy of the ISO standard and they do charge a fee for that and they do control the copies um, that, are, that are out there. So you can't, if you order one, you're not supposed to photocopy it or uh, you know, send it by email to all of your friends. Yeah. Um, but if you are able to, to look at that document, that is a more recent document and uh, does have important differences. Mm -hmm. So they're both valuable. I, I don't want to get too much in the weeds in this conversation because I see we got lots more uh, oh. questions and this one's a tough one. Okay, Dr. Rodriguez, your opinion. Me is there I'm any hope? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this isn't me. This is Dr. Widowati. Uh, based on your opinion, is there any hope uh, to make a, co a vaccine for COVID-19 and when do you expect it? She's, she's a little concerned that uh, everybody's going crazy trying to make a vaccine. 
uh, and um, not sure if we're going to get one that works. So when do you think we'll get one that works? Oh, wow, that's a, that's a challenging question. <laughs> <laughs> that, there, are, there are multiple approaches or multiple companies which are currently working on the vaccine based on what I have read because the, the pandemic has basically limited our reading time because we are mostly analyzing samples. So what, what is emerging is that there are two approaches which are being undertaken. Basically, the first approach is to elicit immunity in the host. So the way a vaccine is developed, and uh, I will basically paraphrase this, uh, we basically have an antigenic principle, which we derive from the vaccine. So we have your uh, one, two, and three, basically the first generation, second generation, third generation vaccines. So the third generation is the DNA vaccines. These are not basically uh, released. So we look at the second generation vaccine, which is the best possible route. So you will basically isolate a receptor or an antigenic principle from the virus itself. You clone and express in either cell line or bacteria, and then you use it as a vaccine. Now, the problem with these kind of measures is that your immune system may not generate or elicit, it may not elicit antibodies against that particular antigen. And that's where the problem arises in vaccine development. The second problem is mutation. For instance, if you have a mutation in a specific protein or an epitope, or what is known as an antigenic principle, you may not have the ability that vaccine won't be universal. For instance, you may develop a vaccine for Asian populations, and it may not be suitable for Caucasian populations because of the change in the receptor profile. So these are the challenges which we are facing currently. The other approach which researchers have undertaken is basically using uh, RNA silencing and RNA interference, but this is also an experimental area. So until we develop a, a particular antigen, which can develop, uh, which can elicit an immune response, we are basically uh, in limbo. <laughs> Okay. There are companies developing, and there's also the issue of the testing, the ethical aspects of testing. We cannot test a vaccine directly unless we go through the procedures like animal model testing, as well as the other aspects, regulatory aspects. So these are the factors which limit the development of the vaccine. Sorry, I could not answer your, your question precisely <laughs> in terms of when. <laughs> well, we were hoping you knew uh, when, no. when it was going to come out so we could make some plans. Uh, but I, I, I guess we're, we're all still not sure if uh, we're going to be able to get out of lockdown uh, yeah, sometime soon. Your as <laughs> your as we're, we're basically going backwards in time, we're, we're, we were locked down and, and we're going back to it again uh, yeah. here in, in New Mexico, even though we're doing better than most of the rest of the country, um, we're starting to notice a, notice a spike right now. So we, we're making changes. So looking forward to getting back to normal. Um, until then, we're all going to be working around uh, COVID-19 in one way or another. Now you have been up, and clo up close and personal with this virus. Can you share from your experience, how did you stay safe? Uh, okay, let, let me explain to you. So basically in the state of Sabah, there was a limitation in terms of the testing capacity. So we have a BSL-3 laboratory at our, at, in our uh, complex, in our university complex. So this laboratory was then assigned for the process of uh, testing these samples. So the samples initially were collected using on VTM, so viral transport media. So we uh, basically adopted a risk assessment, assuming as we know, risk group four. So this involved uh, the use of a containment facility with negative pressure. That's the first aspect. The second aspect involved the usage of PPE. So we had a full uh, respirator setup. We have we are using a, a max air respirator. So that makes it easier to work. And that's basically how we protected ourselves. And of course, we have the other aspects which are spill cleanup. We had a couple of times when we did have spill cleanup. And, we, and what was interesting, we had to adapt the laboratory for this particular pathogen. We, had, uh, we did not have an extractor for RNA extraction. So we adopted centrifuges. And as you know, centrifuges generate a lot of aerosols. So that was the time we had to be really, really careful. We tried to uh, we tried to basically, we did a, we <laughs> breached a taboo, we shifted a centrifuge into our bi biological safety cabinet, which shouldn't be done, you should never do that. But we did, we had to do it because there was no way to protect ourselves from the aerosols. So as time went by, we acquired a, a extractor. And this extractor basically is a unit which is uh, carries out RNA extraction in the uh, confines of a biological safety cabinet. So we were okay, none of us got sick. Although many of us got backaches because of the battery packs. <laughs> we are carrying those uh, respirators and battery packs for around six to eight hours a day. And that did cause a lot of injuries. 
I mean, in terms of fatigue, but we were okay because we had, a, because we were not uh, motivated by the work itself. We are motivated by the need for public health and safety. That was our driver. So we just worked on. Thank you. You're welcome. And I would, uh, I would assume that uh, the backache that you had was much less painful than the side effects of actually catching COVID-19. <laughs> so uh, unfortunate for sure. And I, I hope uh, all of your backs have recovered. We have a, another question on our list and it uh, basically says, uh, if an uh, infectious biological agent gets loose inside the laboratory, so basically the laboratory is grossly contaminated, um, what does it take to decontaminate the whole lab? Okay, let us look at that. So to explain this concept, we basically have to look at primary and secondary containment. So we have a term which is known as containment primary and secondary containment. So primary containment basically protects the laboratory users and the secondary containment protects the environment outside of the laboratory. And when we have uh, basically uh, what you explained in your example is what we term as a breach of containment. Now, when we have a breach of containment, the first thing which we do is we carry out a proper mitigation. Now, a breach of containment, if it's a small breach of containment, for example, if you have a spill, the spill can be cleaned up very easily using our SOP for the spill cleanup. But however, if you have a larger breach of containment, for example, an entire set of vials basically breaking up, which is highly unlikely because again, we have another mitigation uh, checkpoint, which is our in, uh, volume. We do not work with more than three CC in the lab, three, uh, cubic centimeters or 3 ml. Now 3 ml can be absorbed with uh, a towel. We have a C4 towels. We have all the systems to absorb. So it's very unlikely that you will have a major breach of containment in a containment facility or laboratory. And if we do have a breach of containment in a laboratory, we put in a process uh, a certain uh, there is a certain basically a procedure which we put into place. We, uh, we inform the uh, laboratory users and we basically carry out a decontamination of ourselves as well as a decontamination of the laboratory. Now in, in our containment facility, we use ozone, which is uh, nebulized throughout the system. And we, are, we basically expose the facility to this gas using a, a form of nebulizer. And then we expose it for around 24 hours. And uh, then we do a test using spore strips. So we, it's a big procedure, but basically uh, what I would like to emphasize at this point is that you will not necessarily have a breach of containment if you work with a very small volume. Okay? You, you need to uh, define your volume in your standard operating procedures. Okay? It's highly unlikely that we work with more than three ML. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yes, and that sounds very expensive to decontaminate at that level, uh, that whole facility. So working in smaller volumes and also being mindful that, of any process that might create an aerosol, since that tends to disperse things widely across a space as well. So you talked about having special equipment so that you weren't running, say, a centrifuge with your samples that was leaving it prone to a tube breaking and creating an aerosol. Uh, yeah. in that centrifuge, uh, yeah. that, that sort of thing. So um, thinking about the processes that you're about to use uh, as well as the volumes that you're about to use. So fantastic, thank you for that. Um, uh, we have another person asking a question that brings up an important issue. So sometimes other than viral material that you're collecting, uh, if yeah. you're collecting other research materials from the field, they might be contaminated by a virus or a bacteria, which you may or may not know whether they are or not. Uh, how, do, how do you do a risk assessment for that? Since okay. you can't really define exactly what's out there in the environment. Okay, thank you for the question. Okay, we look at it at this, this, when we don't know the risk, we assume the highest risk group. That's the basic, the rule, the rule we follow. So if we don't know the risk, for example, you have OPIM, other potentially infectious material. Or for example, if you're working with a COVID-19 patient sample, for, it's a serum sample, but the patient may also be, have other, uh, other infections. For example, he, may, he or she may have hepatitis or other infections. And there is a likelihood of having multiple biological agents inside a single sample, but what we receive is a hospital uh, sample. So in this case, we assume the highest risk. And this is particularly the case when you work with soil samples. For example, the bacillus anthracis is a common microflora in most soils. So you find bacillus, different species of bacillus among these is bacillus anthracis, which is found, for example, in the cattle hide in leather, 
as well as in the soil. And you have to be careful when you culture the samples, you will streak it on a plate and then you will run a molecular test uh, analysis, uh, DNA sequencing, and you say, oh, it was bacillus enteresis all this, all this time. And this can be very dangerous. So be very careful when you isolate pathogens from the soil and especially from organisms. Assume the highest risk and work within this, the envelope or the scope of that high risk. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for a moment here, the audience is quiet. So I'll take a moment to, to ask you a question all the way at the beginning of your presentation. You were showing the AMP model, mm -hmm. assessment, mitigation, and then performance measures to see how the mitigation steps work. Mm -hmm. And that, that makes a lot of sense. I do my assessment, I put my mitigations in, in place, and then I do a performance measure to make sure that they, they work. And uh, does that mean that my work is done and I can just stop and I never have to think about it again? Or should I be doing a performance assessment uh, on a scheduled basis, on a regular basis? Should I be doing it again in response to something that happens? I mean, is, is, is AMP like this one-time thing? Is it a yearly thing? <laughs> Okay, Let, let's, uh, okay, I'm sure you know the answer what you're asking me for the audience. <laughs> so we basically look at the uh, performance assessment in terms of the regular audit. It's like, it's like a machine. So you have your car, you service your car, you have your regular intervals to change the fuel and, uh, sorry, to change the oil. And then you have your uh, breakdown maintenance. So you have your routine maintenance and your breakdown maintenance. So when we man manage a laboratory bio-risk management system, we look at both these aspects. So the regular, the routine maintenance is basically the audit, which is conducted periodically. And this periodicity is defined by the IBC in consultation with the bio, bio, bio safety officers. So they may, for instance, if you have a laboratory with high traffic, you may have a periodicity, maybe even once a month, or if you change biological agents, you have multiple experiments, you may have to do multiple uh, assessments. So basically what we have is our standard operating procedure and we also have a checklist. And we usually work in a buddy system. So when we follow our checklist, our, our buddy will uh, tick off on that uh, the checklist itself. So we have the system in place. Now, if there is a breach of containment, we basically refer back to the records. Okay, that's the aspect of the routine maintenance. The other aspect, which is the breakdown, what I refer to as the breakdown, is basically looking at incident and accident in, uh, analysis. So we have uh, three basic levels, near miss, incident, and accident. Okay, this is actually a term which is also used in aviation safety. So you have an accident when you have an event which basically causes harm. It causes either morbidity or mortality or other injury. And we also have incidents. Incidents basically don't lead to any physical harm. However, they have a potential, you can basically look at them and we have a near miss as well. So these are areas which you look at. So whenever we have an in near miss accident or an incident, we have a standard operating procedure to report this. And when we identify that causative, so we do an accident analysis to identify what is the cause of that particular accident or incident and we apply the mitigation after looking at that. So this process goes on continuously during the uh, laboratory by risk management as we monitor the system. Okay, so we look at incident and accident analysis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I see we have a question from Dr. Subash himself. Uh, Dr. Subash, would you like to use your microphone to ask your question? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. Because we have many students in the virtual room, so uh, for their benefit, please can you elaborate a little bit about the biosecurity aspect? Because you have many samples of the COVID, so to make sure that it will not go in wrong hands. Dr. Kelly will take the question. Oh, is it directed to me, Dr. Subhash? Uh, both, both of you can add. Oh, okay. no I think <laughs> ladies first, Dr. Kelly. <laughs> Dr. Kelly first. Dr. Kelly. Okay, so, so you're absolutely right. The, the, the pathogens that require the most uh, protections from a biosecurity standpoint seem to be the pathogens that are either the most dangerous or the most unusual, right? So one of the reasons that we get concerned in the United States when somebody arrives on our soil that has Ebola, for instance, is both how severe that illness is and also that it shouldn't necessarily be here. And it's disturbing to have that uh, potential that it might be passed through our population. 
So with COVID-19, you have so many samples at this point, and, and I can say this because it's happening in our country. We have so many samples at this point that in a lot of ways you have individuals handling samples who are um, surge capacity. They've received recent training in being able to do these jobs to help track th some of these things. Um, they've been trained very quickly. Uh, we feel that we've given them the right amounts of information that they need. Uh, and at the same time, we are concerned because they're not used to doing this particular job. They're doing that for long hours. And so what you want to do first is have material control and accountability systems in place such that once a sample is received, where it is, where it's going to, what the volume of that sample should be, when it gets to where it's going, pieces of information like that help us to figure out whether or not one of those samples isn't where it's supposed to be, or if a volume of that sample is missing. That's very hard to do at the scale. So I don't expect, but I don't know uh, whether it's, it's being done perfectly or not. I, I, I think it would be very hard to be perfect about it. But if you could, that allows you to know when something has gone missing you still have to determine whether that was something that was inadvertent. So somebody misplaced it, lost it, versus whether somebody has intentionally diverted it to some other cause. That's harder to do. And it's much harder to do when we're working at the scale with this number of samples. And so largely you do the best you can. The samples that we handle are controlled by specific individuals who are trained to handle those samples. They're accountable for them. Each sample gets a unique identifying number and it's recorded as it goes through its processes all the way through until that sample is destroyed if it's legal to destroy it. Now remember in our country, some samples have to be retained for legal reasons. But there's a record that follows it that goes all the way through, like I said, the destruction and the confirmation that that entire sample has been destroyed. But yes, there's, a, there's a, even an information security issue that we have because here, like many places in the world, patient information is protected. So the fact that someone was positively diagnosed with COVID-19 is not supposed to be public knowledge because we're concerned in our country that people will be mistreated by others, potential employers, doctors, insurance companies, because they've had this disease. And we don't even know right now what this disease does to people long-term. So this could be considered a pre-existing condition that would affect their ability to get treated appropriately years from now. Uh, so we have some information security issues. Now, to my knowledge, there's nothing, the, the, the information relative to this virus, um, its genetic code, other things like that, none of that is, is protected information. To my understanding, most people have posted the genetic information from several uh, different samples of this virus. So we don't worry about that. Um, but we do worry about uh, people getting uh, physical access to the areas where we, where we work with that particular pathogen. And if people are doing research with that pathogen, I know that we're concerned that the information developed from that research can be stolen by other groups hoping to either uh, affect the success of that research or to take credit for that research when it didn't belong to them in the first place. So there's a, there's a lot of security issues going on, uh, biosecurity issues going on. Uh, some of them are financially driven, but some of them are outright because if you look at countries where there aren't many cases, there's absolutely a concern that somebody with ill intent could release more virus into that country um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, I, I can't really speak to them because I, I don't think like that as, as a person. I, I, I don't believe that biological substances should be used as weapons, but uh, I, I, think, I think that you, you could terrorize, um, you know, quite a few countries using this material.
uh, because there is a lot of fear in the community about it. So that was a long answer. I apologize for that. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, how do you feel about it? Uh, I think I share your views, Dr. Kelly, regarding the, uh, uh, there have been uh, cases where, whereby there have been uh, security breaches in terms of the data security, as multiple groups are trying to develop vaccines and they want to outdo the other, because that is where the economic uh, aspect of this virus lies. I mean, that's the economic trigger, which, uh, which, uh, facilitates all these events. But what we have to also look at is, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I think epidemiologists have to look at something very uh, uh, very closely. Is there a community or a system in which there's a sudden event? Like there's no uh, transition. For instance, you have an area which is under lockdown and you suddenly have an event which is like a spreader, super spreader event, what they term as. So this may raise certain red flags. Uh, it may indicate that the virus is being intentionally released in that particular community or that particular zone. So I think uh, at this stage in time, uh, of course, as you said, it's very hard to maintain the sample because we are sometimes it's a flood of samples. It's two, three thousand samples coming in and you're basically analyzing and you're storing it and then the freezer capacity runs out. So we basically have to um, uh, incinerate everything. We don't store it because uh, we are not required to do so. However, at this stage, uh, this is where the government has to step in and do more surveillance in terms of the patterns of spread in the community, because it may be indications of uh, as uh, of intentional release. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to leave the microphones open for a moment here. If there is anyone remaining with a question that they would like to say out loud, because I've noticed no one has typed a question recently, uh, please feel free to speak up at this time. When we're doing online courses, we always have to give a couple extra seconds for people to unmute that microphone. <laughs> so uh, I, I think we've uh, learned a lot tonight from you, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. Uh, you have a you. wealth of experience and uh, some very fascinating answers to these questions. And so we're looking forward to you coming back and telling us when a vaccine that works will be ready. <laughs> so as soon as you know, will you promise to let us know? Yes. <laughs> okay, okay it's fantastic. All, it's, yeah. It's, it's all thanks to, actually, I would really like to acknowledge Sandia National Laboratories. They have been instrumental in training us. There are two of us in the lab. Dr. Christopher and myself, both of us were trained by the staff at Sandria, very professional, and we really gained from that training. It is seven years ago, but I still remember all of that training. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. You have a very good memory as well. That's, that's quite obvious. So uh, I think not seeing any further questions right now, um, I will go ahead and turn everything back over to the MC. Thank you so much, Dr. Rodriguez, for all the wonderful information. Thank you. You take very care much. of yourself. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. Stay safe and have a very good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Kenneth, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Sudha, for moderating the session. It was a great session today. On behalf of the organizing team, I'd like to thank everyone for attending our sixth program of the Bar Safety and Bar Security Month of October 2020. Before ending the session, we would like to hear feedback from all participants by scanning the code on the screen right now. We promise the evaluation survey will not take you more than one minute. Your feedback will be greatly appreciated. You can either scan the QR code or go to the link below. The link will be provided in the chat box as well. After the completion of the survey, you will receive an instant participation certificate in a short while. And I will keep this light running for two more minutes for you all to scan the QR code. We're looking forward to have you all joining us again in the next session. Thank you again, everyone, and we wish you a good health and safety. Dr. Subhash, are you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I will share the PDF and the PowerPoint version of you to, to you via, power, uh, via the Gmail and you can pass it to the participants. Okay, I'll do that right after the session closes.
Yeah, I mean, uh, this QR code helps them to download your presentation, Dr. Kenneth. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The second, second QR code. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's very well organized. Thank you very much. Well, thank Congratulations you. Congratulations on a very good job. Very well done. Oh, thank you, Dr. Kenneth. Thank you. I hope everyone has the chance to scan the QR code and I'm going to end the meeting. See you soon in our next webinar. Stay safe and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Okay.